page cache page or if it's a swap or if it's an anonymous page, write it out to the swap device. Um, so the way that's done is in the process page table, it goes in and basically, and it unmaps the page table entry um, that maps a particular page in the process's linear address space to a page frame on the system. Um, and then once that happens, the kernel can do a lot of um, interesting things with, uh, with the page after that. Um, and we'll show how transparent memory compression does that. But first I wanna talk about swapping and uh, the horrible reputation that it's gotten, um, <laughs> and rightfully so, um, that um, most people size their machines and their virtual machines with RAM sizings that um, exceed what their, wor what their workload needs um, in order to avoid any swap. Um, and so you, you really size your machines on a peak memory load basis um, because you can't, you can't deal with swap. You can't deal with the latency it introduces, the non-determinism uh, that it introduces. Um, so uh, understandably, a lot of people, you know, don't, don't run swap. I, I typically don't run swap. Um, and so let's talk about a little about why swapping is so bad. So swapping out pages is really not so bad um, because most of the work done to unmap pages in Linux is done by kswapd. Um, and so it's not even done on the workload thread and then when the write out to the page, uh, to the swap device is done, um, that is done asynchronously, the, the block device layer queues it up and writes it out in a semi-efficient manner. So swapping out is not really the problem, it's, it's swapping in is the problem. Um, because when a process hits a page that the kernel has swapped out, that process is blocked until that page can be pulled in from the swap device. Um, and, the, and there's just nothing the kernel can do about that. Um, and so it depends on the speed of your swap device, how long your process is blocked. And on typical rotational media, that's gonna be on the order of 10 milliseconds um, for the seek and then the read. So that is a lot of time for most CPU intensive workload. Um, so you can really think of it as if you've got a CPU bound load and all of a sudden it runs out of memory and you start swapping, that load becomes an IO bound load um, because now it's via swapping. Uh, now it's waiting on, on its process pages to become available and that is no good. And this is what that looks like. So this is uh, running a spec JBB performance benchmark and you can probably tell about how many gigabytes of RAM this system has, right? <laughs> it's 10. Uh, because at 10, when the heap size exceeds the memory size, you lose about 95% of your performance. And in this particular case, this is, a, uh, this is on a two core system with uh, SMT4 in power terminology, that's like hyper-threading, four-way hyper-threading is what you can think about that as. Um, so, and during this, during this time, the CPUs are mostly idle. They're, they're stuck in IO wait while, they, while page faults are being serviced, right? Um, and so that's, that's no good. And this is the swap activity um, during that same time. So you see swap just skyrockets and you reach an equilibrium point where your, your disk is servicing requests as fast as it can and now you're, you're in this equilibrium at max disk throughput and the whole system throttles and you know, it's no good. Um, and uh, one thing I wanna add here is that with this, this is on rotational media, with SSDs this would look a little better. Uh, the throughput would be higher and latency, you, know, you don't have to seek latency um, associated with rotational media. Um, but unfortunately SSDs, the SSD technology right now doesn't really handle um, write heavy loads very well. You'll burn out your SSD if you use it as a swap device, use it heavily as a swap device. Um, so that can solve some of these problems, but unless you wanna burn up your SSD really quickly, I don't recommend using it as a heavy swap device. Um, so this is the case that I was referring to earlier. I've actually talked to sysadmins who would rather their process be killed 
by the out of memory manager than have it have the severe latency and non-deterministic performance that swap IO introduces. Um, so what we really need is a way to smooth out this cliff that happens when you, uh, when you overcommit memory, right? Everything's running along just fine and then all of a sudden, man, it just drops off a cliff. Um, and so Z-Swap is a way to do that. And so um, when I made this presentation, I wasn't sure how much everyone would know about in-depth on the memory manager and, uh, and how it works. So I'll, I'll run through this quickly just to get us all on the same page when I start talking about how Z-Swap works. Um, so all memory in the system is managed in a, but in a unit called page frame. On x86, that's, that's usually for, uh, 4K. On power systems, it's 4K or 64K. Differing architectures have different page sizes. But this is the basic unit in which the hardware understands memory. Um, and so the, the TLBs, all the memory hardware, works with memory on this, on this granularity. Um, and when the kernel starts, it creates something called a, mem a memory map, and it creates a page structure that tracks what each page frame in the system is being used for. <coughs> um, oh, and one more thing on this. Every allocated page frame in the system exists on one of two lists in the memory manager. One is the active list, one is the inactive list. And so um, the idea is to keep pages that are, as the names might imply, active, the ones that programs frequently reference in memory all the time so that you never have to incur I.O. to do that, while in the inactive list are the pages that are considered for, for reclaim when the system needs more memory. Um, so when the system is low on page frame, it will search from the end of the inactive list, and the heuristic is the least recently used heuristic. It, it assumes that if the page hasn't been accessed for a very long time, it's not, access, it's not likely to be accessed again in the near future. Um, so it searches from the end of the inactive list to look for pages to reclaim. And pages can be of all types. So the, the three that you'll most likely encounter are clean page cache pages, um, which uh, happen on a, on a read, like if you do a copy command, for example. It's going to read a page into the page cache and then write it out somewhere on disk. Well, even after that command is complete, the page still exists in the page cache, because you might use it again. Um, but if you don't use it again and it gets to the inactive list and the kernel needs memory, it goes, hey, this page is here. It's clean, so I don't have to write it to disk. This is, this is a cheap reclaim situation, right? I can just remove this from the page cache and use the page for something else. And it, and it takes no disk activity to do that. Um, the second time you'll run into is a dirty page cache. So it's the same as I said before, except it's been written to. And so now it is dirty in memory. It has to be written out to disk before you can use that page for something else. Um, and the third most common type of page you'll encounter is an, an, an anonymous user page. And so in user space, if you do a malloc or um, any number of things, um, it will allocate things on the um, process heap which is the anonymous memory uh, region. And these don't have any file backing. These pages don't have any file backing. And so you, the swap device acts as their file backing. Um, and when you want to swap a page out, you need, first need to write it to disk because the memory has to be maintained in a persistent state. You, if you move it out of memory, you have to get it back somehow when the process wants it back or obviously bad things happen. Um, so, talking about anonymous page reclaim, since that's the part of memory that Zcash is going to be operating on. Um, so this is what I, I alluded to this earlier. It uses a process called memory unmapping. And that is the process of going through the page tables of all the processes on the system. And this is at a very high level. The, the kernel does this in a much more efficient way. But it's essentially going through all the page tables of all the processes that have this particular page frame mapped into their process address space and breaking that link. Um, and when it breaks that link, it puts information in the page table that lets the page vault handler know, hey, this page is not present in memory, but you can, you can retrieve this page from, from this location. Um, 
And here's a graphical representation of that. I'm a visual learner myself. I'm a visual learner myself, so the diagrams help me. So you got your task struct, your MM struct, and then the page table that comes off of it. Um, and that's, I, I hadn't annotated all these, but that's the page global directory, the page middle directory, and the, the page table entry. Um, and then the last stage actually points to a page frame. And you can see that that links into memory, and when you access that linear address space in the process, it's going to look in that page frame. Um, and then you have the mem map down here with a struct page that's on the inactive list that co corresponds to that page frame and lets you know what, what that page frame is being used for. So memory unmapping breaks that, that last link between the, the, between the page table entry and the page frame. Uh, <clears throat> and after that happens, the kernel doesn't lose track of it because it's got a struct page and it's, it's keeping track of those things. But after this point, um, the hardware will take a fault if the process tries to access that memory location again. And, but after we break that link, the kernel becomes much more, it, it can do a lot more things with that page because now it knows that no user process can access it. And that gives the kernel a certain freedom to do what it wants to with that page. So this is the um, layout of a swap entry. And this is the information that is put in the page table entry so that on a page fault, the uh, kernel can find out where the page can be loaded from. And it's very simple. There's a type and an offset. The type is, uh, specifies which swap device the page can be found in, and the offset tells you the page offset within the device where the page has been stored. And so, what the, uh, so when on a page fault, it will go, oh, okay, I know the swap device. It'll calculate the offset, convert that to disk blocks, go and read that disk block, populate the page, map, remap the kernel page tables to point to that page frame, and then resume the process. So that's, that's page reclaim for anonymous memory crash course. <laughs> um, so onto, onto the swap, which now we can talk about now that I've laid that foundation. So Zswap is a feature that hooks into the swap code, um, basically into the write and read paths of the, of the swap code. And <clears throat> it, when a swap out is about to happen and it's going to write the page to the swap device, there is a hook. Um, and there's, a, there's actually something that I don't envision here that very often the, the front swap API, it's been in the kernel for probably six or seven releases, but it's a very thin glue layer that allows um, other kernel uh, drivers to hook into the swap path at, at, at critical points in the swap out path and then in the page fault resolution path um, to capture swap devices right before they're written out. Uh, not swap devices, swap, swapped out pages. Um, and so what it can do is it can intercept that swap page right before it's been read right before it's about to be written out to the device. And if the write to the front swap backend, in this case Zswap, succeeds, then it will not proceed to write the page to the swap device. It'll say something there has the page. It's persistent. It's keeping track of it. I don't care about it anymore, just so long as I can get it back later. So that is how we avoid, how Zswap avoids a disk write on a swap out. Um, now, we don't care about the swap out path so much since we already established that it doesn't impact performance too much since case swap D is primarily the person who does that and, it does, and, and writes can be scheduled a lot better than reads can <coughs> for, for later processing. Um, so the thing that we really care about is the swap in time. Well, now that we've got the page in this compressed memory pool, when the fault occurs, there is a hook in the swap read page path that look, tries to look up that, um, that swap offset type pair in the compressed cache. And if it finds the page, then it can decompress it from memory and resolve the fault much more quickly than it would have to do a read to the block IO layer and who knows when that will come back. And so that really cuts down on your page, uh, your, page in, your swap in time. Um, the code for that is in mainline as of uh, 3.11, and it's in the MM uh, subtree at zswap.c. <clears throat> if 
to stick with me here. I uh, got a sore throat this morning, so if I start fading, let me know. And if I'm not, if you can't understand what I'm saying, I can slow down. <laughs> um, so another thing I want to touch on is the butt. And so this, right now, I've been talking about the compressed pool as this this black box. Um, and it's important to know uh, what the black, how the black box operates. It's not that complex, um, but it does lead, it, it does um, have some gotchas later, and you'll see why. So um, ZBUD is the name of the allocator that we use for the compressed pool. And there were two um, functional requirements that we had for the pool that were, um, that kind of worked against one another. So one is you want low fragmentation because you're doing all this work to compress memory. If you can't store those compressed pages efficiently, then that reduces the effective compression of, of what you're doing. At the same time, uh, memory management folks don't like dead ends in the memory management path. Um, they don't like memory that you can't do things with. And so ZSwap allows you to, de if, the page, if, the page, if the compressed pool is full, then you need some way to, to drop the oldest pages out and go ahead and write them to the swap device. Um, so the thing, so the, the conflicting functional requirements were high density storage, but be able to reclaim a page from that storage quickly. Um, and if you've got a lot of compressed pages in a particular compressed pool page, then you have to write out a lot of them before you can get that page back. So the, the high density storage with the quick rig claim of compressed pool pages uh, kind of made for uh, differing points of view when talking about this design at uh, the memory management conference earlier this year. So what ZBUD does is it only stores two compressed pages per page frame. Um, it does this for Simpl simplicity reasons and you know for fast reclaim. Um, it's so when you try to reclaim a page from the compressed pool, at most you have to decompress two pages and write them back. Um, and that was a nice bound that a lot of the, the kernel developers that care about having to service bugs, <laughs> so they really cared about that. Um, unfortunately, that also caps the effective compression at 50%. So if you have workload pages that compress really, really well, that, that compression won't be realized with ZBUD. Now, um, there is another allocator out there that we were using beforehand called ZS malloc, and it's currently in the kernel staging tree. It has higher density, but the flip side of that is it takes a lot more work to reclaim those pages when there's lots of compressed pages in them. So still working with the community on that one. But the code for ZBUD got merged with ZSwap, and it's also in the MemM tree at zbud.c. This is just a quick diagram of how the simple design of ZBUD kind of, it, it helps with the mainlining process, because th complex things going into the memory manager take a very, very long time to get in. Um, so the, the first buddy, which is the first compressed page that comes in, gets stored right at the page aligned at the top of the page, at the beginning of the page frame, the next buddy that comes in gets stored at the, uh, you know, whatever you want to consider it, right aligned at the end of the page. Um, and that is to keep that, keep fragmentation from happening with two objects stored, you know, justified at the ends of the uh, page frames, that free area in the middle never fragments. And it keeps lists of, you know, the slack space left in, Un unbuddied pages, um, but this, I, you know, again, limits you, caps you at 50% compression. But as you'll see later, that still yields really nice uh, performance benefits and I/O, um, the I/O elimination. So enabling ZSwap. Um, Mm -hmm. So I guess that's, that's, that's 
Right. So um, what I, di I didn't show on that slide is that um, a buddy can't start at any offset within the page. Um, there, there's a, it divides the page frame up into blocks um, that are greater than the cache line size. And so it, 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 the buddies do start on a cache aligned <laughs> area. Um, so Z-Swap. So right now, Z-Swap has to be built into the kernel. It can't be loaded as a module. And the reason for that is because it um, depends on symbols that are not exported from the kernel in the swap stuff, in the, in the swap code. Um, and exporting those symbols would create a war that I don't want to fight. Um, so we're, we're, hope, we're hoping to get it um, into a loadable driver form later because that, that, it, that is better. Um, but right now, it's, it's built into the kernel. So it, that brings up the question of, well, it, for distros, it's like, well, I need to, it either needs to be on or off by default uh, if it's built in because it's going to be there regardless. Um, and so the default is that it's off. And that is a reasonable choice since <laughs> it's new code and it has um, hooks in the memory reclaim stuff and the, um, it has just not been vetted in a wide uh, selection of platforms and workloads and environments. So to enable it, um, it takes a kernel boot parameter, uh, zswap.enabled equals one. And that will enable it with the default compressor, which is LZO. Um, and, LZ, and LZO is a build requirement um, for zswap in the kernel. So if you select it, if you select zswap in your kernel config, it will build in LZO as well, which is no problem because almost all kernels build in LZO anyway because that, I think, is the default compressor for the, the Linux kernel image. Um, you can specify another compressor. Um, any, any compressor in the kernel's cryptographic API can be used. So um, deflate is just one of them, and I give the example here. Um, I guess I'll also mention here that um, the Power7 Plus hardware, that's a shameless plug, uh, has a hardware accelerator in it that um, is, is upstream. and. In our case, we use uh, 842, which is the driver for the compression module for that hardware compressor. Um, there's only one tunable, and this was this was by design. We we wanted it to be kind of an the the hope is for it to be an always on uh, minimal configuration type of thing. Um, and so there's only one tunable, which is max pool percent, which dictates how much of RAM the compressed pool can occupy. And this is, just a, this is just a safety measure until better heuristics can, can come in about what the size of the compressed pool should be. But those heuristics don't exist right now, and so it's a, it's a tunable um, to keep the compressed pool, pool from completely, completely overrunning your system, right? Um, there are a couple of places in SysFS and DebugFS that are useful. Um, so the Sys modules, Z-swap parameters, that's where this max pool percent is. It can be set at boot time or changed at runtime. Um, and also statistics on Z-swap activity are, are held in debug FS under the Z-swap um, attribute. Uh, front swap is also at this same location, sys kernel debug front swap. Um, and it has higher level metrics about what it's sending down to Z-swap. And so both of those can give you insight into, you know, are the pages being stored in the compressed cache? How many of them are being accepted? How many of them are being rejected? Things are like, and, and why they're being rejected. Some pages can't be captured by the compressed pool because they can't be stored efficiently. Um, sometimes it can't secure memory for the compressed pool. There's a number of ways that can fail, and these areas kept, keep statistics on how many have failed and why. So yeah, enough talk, let's do this. All right, so this is a graph. The, the blue line you've already seen, that was the performance cliff before. Um, the red line is the, the default uh, with software compression with LZO, and the top line is with the Power7 Plus hardware accelerator. So as you can see, um, what we've done there, uh, up there in the subtitle, I've set max pool percent to 40%. So the compressed pool can occupy 40% of memory. With ZBUD, basically what that means is that you can 
over, you can overcommit memory by 40 percent, or, or run your memory load up to 140 percent before you start seeing the, those drastic swap, uh, the, the drastic swap cliff. You can see that eventually you do overrun even the compressed pool, and then your performance converges on the normal swap. But this does give you a nice, uh, a, a more gradual slope <laughs> than, the, than the cliff you, you see in the blue line. Yes? So the compression ratio was 50%. Um, and, and that's the pages compressed to about a third of a page, but you lose some of that because of Z-Bud. Right? Uh, that that you, your effective maximum compression is limited to 50% right now. And we, that's in the future work. We're, we're wanting to be able to realize the full compression. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, so the question was, uh, this, maybe this could be remedia uh, remediated by um, using ZS malloc, right? Is that what you said? Right, Z button, yeah. I do. Um, so the question was, do I have this graph with the ZS malloc allocator? Um, no, I don't. Not with me. The graph does exist, though. And basically what it looks like is th this, uh, this area right here, the, the area where the benefit is realized, extends much farther out. Um, because your effective, comp the pool doesn't fill, fill as quickly because it's storing the pages more efficiently. And so this area of benefit, you know, reaches out to, you know, 16, 17 gigabytes. Um, and that's an, impor that's an important thing to point out because the, the length of this area here where you uh, realize the benefit depends on a number of factors. One of them is how much, you, how big you allow the pool to be. Another one is how compressible your pages are. If your pages are not very compressible, then this, you know, will be, this, this area will be shorter. Um, with ZS Malloc, for example, if you have highly compressible pages, I've done it even with zero pages, and LGO compresses zero pages very, very well. <laughs> you know, you won't see the end of the benefit. I mean, it's, you can run it out to 20 gigs, and, and you'll still see zero swap IO. Um, so, again, we're, look, we're trying to get the Z, ZS Malloc back in there that way that th this graph looks a lot better with ZS Malloc. <laughs> um, so yes, um, but this is really, this graph is really a side effect of um, this. So, oh man, we started late. Uh, so as you can see, the swap IO, you've seen the blue line before, the swap IO, there is little or no swap all the way out to where the compressed pool gets filled. And this is, that, and this is really the, the cause of the performance increase is that you're not having to go to disk to read these things in or write them out. Um, it's all just being compressed and decompressed from memory, which is great if you're on a SAN or shared storage or slow storage or anything like that. Um, this is really good news. Um, so I kind of uh, already started covering this, but th there's three regions of the graph there and I wanna go over them real quick. So in case one, we're, we're in the undercommitted state and we're not swapping any pages, so you're seeing you're seeing nominal performance, 100%. Um, and this is what RAM and swap look like, right? Is you got you've got some free RAM available, and swap is completely idle. And so, if swap is idle, Z swap is also idle. In case two, that's where the that's the region of effect for Z swap. Um, you have RAM; it's fully used. It would be swapping, but instead, it's compressing. So part part of RAM is being used as a compressed pool. Um, and, but during this time, there's little or no swap I.O. Unless your pages don't compress well enough or for some reason you can't secure memory for the compressed pool, those pages are getting captured in the cache. Um, case three is where you've over, so you've, the compressed pool has grown to the max pool percent and it can't grow anymore. In that case, the oldest pages from the compressed pool get decompressed and written to swap. Um, this is nice because the swap 
ID, the swap entry that you used as an index into the compressed pool is still reserved in the underlying swap device. And so basically you're just resuming the write back to disk that was going to happen before Zswap intercepted it. So there was a lot of policy decisions. Um, a lot of academic uh, exercises in this area. You used a static, pre static pre-allocated pool of RAM to use. Um, we decided to go with a dynamic one uh, for this because if, if, you have si if you have sized your workload properly, then you want it to operate fully uncompressed, right? Um, you, only, you only want memory to be eaten up by the compressed pool if it's actually needed. Um, and like I said, we're, see we're looking for an always on solution and this would require user intervention to tell, tell how big I want my memory pool ahead of time and things like that. So we decided to go with a dynamic system. Uh, the pool sizing, um, again, the heuristics weren't there. Decided to go with a, a user tunable there. And then the, po uh, the pool overflow action. So front swap allows the back end to actually fail the, the write. You know, if you go into swap write page and it sends it off to the back end, the back end can say, no, I couldn't take it. Um, and that is an easy way to handle the pool full situation. Um, it's what you send it off to the back end, the back end goes, I got no more room. And just reject it and then it goes to the swap device. The problem is, is that means that least, less recently used pages are in the compressed cache while more recently used swapped out pages fall through to the swap device. You get an inverse LRU thing, um, which is, it is not, kind of runs counter to everything in the memory manager. So we put the mechanism in there, it's a little bit more complicated, but to write back the oldest pages in the compressed cache on the back end to make, to reclaim pages that can be used for new things coming in on the front. Um, so the use cases here are, uh, if you're an infrastructure as a service user, you probably pay for the size of your instance um, in RAM and CPUs. So if you are buying one that's oversized for your workload, on you know, the off chance that your workload goes over the amount of RAM that you have, and you know, if you're running with swap, its performance degrades, or if you're running swapless, the out of memory killer kills it. Um, you can use Zswap as, a, as kind of a backstop for those workloads. And so if it runs in half a gig of RAM normally, but every once in a while runs up you know, two or 300 megs over that, then this can allow you to run that workload in a smaller instance and guard against that really, uh, really sharp penalty for swapping. <clears throat> As an ISS provider, you can enable this, kind of the other side of the coin, you can enable this at the hypervisor level, and in the KVM case, I'm not sure about them, maybe the same thing, um, instance memory is considered anonymous user space memory by the hypervisor and can be swapped just the same as any other process. And so you can increase guest density on the machine that way. Um, and then there, there are systems where you are either at your, act, you're at your maximum memory capacity or the system doesn't have upgradable memory. And you'd like to continue to run your workload on it, but you can't because the, workload now, the w workload's memory requirements exceed what you have. Um, just a couple of gotchas. Um, because the swap entry is used as an identifier in the compressed pool, you can't actually store more pages in the compressed cache than can be written out to the swap device. So if your swap device is smaller than basically, you know, is, won't hold as many pages as max pool percent of memory will, then you'll be limited by the, the swap device size, not by max pool percent. I'll quickly refer to these other ones. So uh, ZRAM is um, a driver that is, it also works on swap pages, but it is the swap device rather than a caching layer on top of it. It's, ba it's basically a comp compressed RAM disk that you can do, you can do swap on, dev, ZRAM, zero, and it is a compressed RAM disk. This is really popular in the embedded community where they can't actually have a swap device. They don't have the, the flash memory they don't want to put a swap partition on it. Um, and that work is being headed up by Min Chan Kim on the memory management list, if you care about uh, looking into that. Uh, that works better from, for some embedded things, but it, it's that dead end that the memory management people really don't like in that one, if it is the swap device and it gets written in there, 
because it mimics a, mimics a block device, there's no way to get it out of there, and so there's no way to reclaim that RAM. Uh, Zcash is another um, thing, and it's for file cache uh, or page cache compression. Um, that work has been being done by Bob Liu, um, also on the memory management list. Um, it, it was in staging. Zcash has gone through so many iterations um, that, and, and what it does has changed so much over time, but basically what it is now is, is page cache compression. Uh, page cache compression has a unique, a unique challenge over swap um, compression in that if you compress a page cache page that falls off the, you know, that, that memory reclaim gets, you know, one of these clean page cache pages that I was talking about earlier. That was cheap reclaim before, now you're compressing it and storing it. Um, and if you're not really confident that that page will be accessed again, then you're actually regressing performance because you're compressing that page, storing it, and then eventually it'll just need to be freed and it never got reread, but you went through all the trouble of compressing it. Um, so there are the heuristics to determine whether a page cache page will be used again and the confidence level associated with that are, is just not there yet. And so that, um, that is just an area of future work. Um, so this is, a, this is a new area. Um, to my knowledge, no other operating systems do this. Um, and really what we'd like to go with it is that compressed memory wouldn't be just something that kind of offshoot, that kind of hooks into the memory manager and you know, kind of does some things off to the side, but that eventually compressed memory will be a first class citizen in the memory manager. And it will just be another type of memory that the, that the central memory manager manages. Um, and that it, maybe it can even uh, do uh, preemptive compression, you know, cause not wait till the swap has engaged, but oh, memory pressure is increasing let me, let me have a kernel thread, you know, compress some pages in the background, make room, um, and, and analyze memory load over time to see, okay, well, I, I see how this process is behaving. Maybe if I compress some pages, I can keep it in RAM without it getting into stress. Um, so this is the summary. Zswap, it's in mainline. Uh, go forth and play with it. It's the off by default and listed as experimental, um, but uh, you can enable it, just add it to the boot line. Um, allows you to do more aggressive memory sizings, more toward the uh, average than the peak, and uh, can, can act as a safety, net, a safety net against completely trashing your performance, your performance uh, on your workload uh, in, case you, in case you do uh, hit swap. So are there any questions? Yes. So about choosing uh, which encryption, sorry, which compression algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, if you use one that's slower and gives you better compression, because you use the fast one, right, to compare with your card, um, do you, basically, from what I understand, you end up having more fake RAM mm -hmm. by compressing better, right. but you're losing more CPU time doing so. Yes. And now you're trading CPU time versus how long you take before you hit the disk. Uh, you, on your slide, you only compared two algorithms that seem to be compressing about the same, yes. so the drop-off was exactly in the same place. Right. Right. Uh, have you done anything with something that else that they made that compresses much better but slower? Yeah. To see how you win or not? So I, I have run the test on deflate before. And again, if you, do, if you use deflate, you're going to look get the same graph with ZBUD. And that's because ZBUD is capping the effective compression um, because it's not storing pages very efficiently because uh, if you want to reclaim, it needs to do that quickly. Um, now, if you use ZS malloc, which has very dense packing properties, then yes, you would see the advantage of moving to a higher compression algorithm. Um, and like I said, that, that area, that region of effect for the compressed cache would be much wider. And how much slower is it? I mean, on your graph, is it like twice as slow, three times, 10 times? Um, so it, it depends on your CPU, right? Um, Something recent from today, right? Right, right. Um, but um, typically what we've seen is that 
uh, the, the CPUs go, go nearly idle when, whenever you're doing the swap stuff. Um, the, I'd have to say that I've not done extensive stuff with, with other algorithms. I think it sounds like if you're hitting swap on disk, mm -hmm. by that time you just up the algorithm to something that compresses better. Yes. That's probably that's, one way to do it. And that, that wasn't captured in my future work, but there, has, there, there is an effort to make the, um, al the allocator pluggable and changeable at runtime. And so you, you could like, oh, you know, if you could compress a few pages with another algorithm and say, oh, these things r compress really well. You could switch to it, you could be adaptive. Um, okay. And that's future work, it doesn't do that now. But. And the related question is you said how much RAM you use for the compressed cache mm -hmm. uh, swap, I should say. Um, for now, it's something you just select. And how much do you want to give it? Do you give it 50%? Because of course, there's the overhead of going through that. Right. right? If you give it only 10%, you're not winning that much because now you don't have enough RAM to do it. Right. So have you found any sweet spot? Are you still tuning that? Um, yes, so that, that's part of the heuristics, right? It's right. like, it'd be nice if we could figure that out dynamically. Um, so the, let me restate the question. Um, so how do you find, your, find the sweet so spot for the size of the compressed and pool? Even if there's not an answer for everyone, what, have you found anything on your side for now? It, it depends on how much you anticipate your workload over running, right? So, I mean, if, if it runs at a gig most of the time, but every once in a while peaks up to one and a half gigs, then you want to do max pool percent 50, because that's 150% memory commit at 1.5 gigs, right? Right. So basically for both answers, you need to find out how much memory you're missing and then from there tune it to make up for it. Right. For now. Right. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, got time for one more question yeah. then we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Sorry, I didn't leave much time for questions. <laughs> but yeah. yes, we can definitely, I'll be outside afterwards and anyone who has a question, I'll be happy to answer. Um, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, what are your plans uh, for adding support for page migration? Okay, so um, there is actually a patch set on the list right now to do that. Um, it requires a change in ZBud, right? Um, and I've actually reviewed, um, I think it's at version two or three now, and we're, we're, we're getting that worked out. And so, there, there is support for that coming in, in ZBud. The, the, the thing is, is that it has to be done at the, com the compressed pool manager level um, because, and basically have to create a layer of indirection that the, the ZBud objects um, can be moved around on the, on, from right now it maps strictly, it maps directly to the physical page frame. But if the page frame can be moved from underneath the ZBud, then you have to have an indirection layer to keep track of that. Say again? Uh, yes, erratic stream. That's actually a structure being used, yes. All right, let's give an applause for Sam Jennings for presenting today. And if you have any more questions, he'll be happy to answer right afterwards. Thank you.